Hey everyone, welcome. I'm very excited to be interviewing Liza today. Welcome, Liza. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and I think everyone knows your name, but for those who don't know who you are, just give us a little background on, you know, where you're at and, you know, how, how you got there. I know you guys are fourth generation dealerships and you've grown yeah. amazing, like amazing in the last few years, but kind of introduce yourself. All right, I'll do a real quick intro and then you can always ask me further questions on areas you might want us to go deeper into. Uh, but as you mentioned, I'm a fourth generation. Uh, I've had the honor and privilege of following three previous, uh, my dad, grandfather, and great-grandfather in leading our company. Um, we're based in Virginia, in Charlottesville, Virginia, but we have dealerships across the state of Virginia into West Virginia, North Carolina, and we're opening a store in Maryland within the next year, so our fourth state. We currently have 24 dealerships. We represent 18 different brands. We don't do a whole lot in the luxury space. Most of our brands are the higher volume non-luxury. We have a little over 1,200 associates in our company. And I am absolutely in love with this industry that we are a part of. I've been in it technically since I graduated from college in 1997. Been in my blood my, my whole life. But I think we are also blessed to be in an industry that impact so many people's lives every single day. Absolutely. And I have so many questions <laughs> through that. And I, I should know some of these, but okay. So did you always want to work in the car dealerships? And because I know I've interviewed some people where they've grown up in it and they're like, I wanted nothing to do with it. I just wanted my family to take care of it. So did you always know? Um, No, actually, I was pretty strong in my intent not to come into the car business, or at least not into the retail side of the business. You know, as I was growing up, my dad worked seven days a week all the time. I didn't see him a whole lot. But now that I know what I know, our company was going through some pretty tough times in the late 80s and 90s, and he was doing what he had to do to keep the company afloat. But because of that, I really saw the business as very transactional. When our company was struggling in the early 90s, we had a saying in our house, six cars a day keeps the banker away. And my dad would come home and I'd be like, how many cars did you sell today? And so it was very transactional. It was very risky in my mind. So I really did not have any intention of coming in the car business. Now, I also, you know, graduated from college in the late 90s where the internet boom was beginning. And we all thought that internet would take over car sales and, and dealerships and we would all be call, buying everything online by 2005. And so I can remember I went to work for American Honda Motor Company after college. So I did stay in the auto industry, but on the manufacturer side. And I can remember interviewing with Honda. And of course, one of their questions was, well, are you just here for a couple of years till you go back and work for your family? And I remember telling them, you know, I don't know what the future of the retail side of our business is going to look like. You know, we have the internet coming. CarMax was, you know, getting pretty big back then. And I said, I, I, I think the industry is very interesting and, and unique, but I don't know that the retail side, what the future looks like. I remember telling them that. Yeah. And so I went to work. My dad was obviously, now he tells me, very excited that I stayed in the industry. Went to work for American Honda out in, at their headquarters in Torrance, California. And I stayed with them for about six and a half years until 2003 when, for different reasons, I decided to come back to the family business. Wow. Okay. And so during that time, what did you do with Honda? Did you already tell me that? Exactly? I didn't. I'll just tell you real quick. They had a management trainee program. And I was a part of nine young people who had just graduated from college. I think two people maybe were like a year or two out of college. But most of us had just graduated and we got to spend a year and a half literally getting paid to learn. The first 13 months of the program, we rotated around every single department of Honda. So I would spend a month in auto sales, a month in Acura, a month in power equipment. I spent a month in motorcycle. We did uh, R&D and exports and finance. And so we really got to learn everything about how a car company is run. And then after that, you got, it was kind of like a, a sorority fraternity type thing where you ranked your top three choices and then each department ranked their top three trainees and then they matched us to a department. And so I chose Honda Auto Sales as my first choice and I got matched uh, there. So that's how I kind of got into the variable side of our business. Wow, okay. And do you have any siblings? Because I didn't hear anything on that. I have a younger sister. 
Okay. She is not involved in the business. She was when she was much younger. She was a service advisor for me at our Volvo store. And then she was living down in Florida working for dealerships down there until she got married. And she now stays at home with her three-year-old daughter. But her hus- they moved back here, and her husband is actually a technician for us at our Volvo dealership. Oh, that's really cool. I love that. And I'm just, just growing up, I, I would imagine, like, I think you mentioned, too, like, you had a different perspective growing up with your dad always working, but now you have more of an understanding because of just the things that were going on in the in the world, and, and then you're running it so yeah. is your dad still involved in running things he is not involved at all day to day in the dealership and and we did a transfer of ownership back in 2012 but i was actually just with him this morning uh-huh. and right now he is working on a project to write a book we hired a writer to work with him to write the 100 year history of our company and what are the lessons that we've learned that are going to help us be around for another 100 years And so I was just with him this morning and we were going through the outline of the book and we actually pulled up all of these different photographs. I mean, just decades and generations worth of photographs and company documents. And Kaylee, I'll tell you one, probably the craziest thing I found this morning. We found the letter that my dad had written to his dad in 1977 and it was a resignation letter. And my dad had said he was leaving the company after 11 years and that he gave my my grandfather 30 days notice and they in the letter he even said let's keep it confidential for 14 days announce it to the managers on august 15th and he was going back to get his mba and he just shared with me today that it was because he and his grandfather couldn't get aligned on the succession plan and how to do the ownership my grandfather wanted to give it all to all of his kids and have my dad have to buy it back from them and there were some complexities to that yeah And so I said this morning, how different our company wouldn't exist had my grandfather accepted that resignation letter and my dad, if he had been stubborn and said, I'm out, CMA wouldn't be here. Oh my! It was a really interesting morning this morning. That is so interesting. And, and just, did he just, did he tell you how your grandfather took that letter? Like how did he, so obviously he convinced him not to resign, but like, did he share more about that that day or that time my my dad he couldn't really remember it he actually said he's not 100 percent sure that he gave the letter to my grandfather oh Um, but he remembers the time when they were at odds over the future of the company Mm -hmm. and so my dad ended up hiring an attorney and my grandfather had an attorney to try to mediate how do we create a succession plan that allows my grandfather to also give to all of his kids while not diversifying the ownership of the company because my dad was the only one working in the company and doing all the hard work. And so thankfully they, they figured it out. Thankfully. Yeah. Cause can you imagine? And the, re- I mean, there's so many companies out there where it's families and there's so many people involved and it's just so amazing that you guys have been around for so long and, you know, gone through those things and are still okay. And, and I'm hope I'm assuming still like, like each other. <laughs> we, I am so grateful for my dad. I mean, while he's not involved in the company anymore, he is my greatest mentor and advisor. And when I just need somebody to run a tough situation by, he is always a, an ear and gives me input. Some I take, some I don't. He and I joke about it. He said, he, he always shares Kaylee that, you know, he worked for his dad for a lot of years and then he ran the company and I worked for him. And then I ran the company and for a long time, he was working for me. He said, so I got, I had to, I had to take input from my dad. Then I got to make decisions and now I got to take input again. And uh, so he jokes, he can give me advice, but I don't have to listen to it. Yeah. And, but he, he's just, uh, you know, been an incredible mentor and I value the 20 years that we've gotten to work together. Yeah. That's incredible. And you've made a lot of changes. I think with the company, I think I was reading about how you guys have, I don't know the exact term, but basically employee stock ownership, which is, I think, a really, really awesome thing to do. Because I, I think that gives your employees that different, not perception, but like you just have, it, you feel like different you mentality. It. Yeah, it's different mentality. Thank you. It's like you feel like you're part of it and you have a seat at the table and you're making a difference and, you know, you're going to you're going to succeed, too, in a, in a bigger way by having yes. that. that own, yeah. So you started that. No, we actually, um, my dad started it in 1979. 
Wow. And he really started it for two reasons. One, as a retirement plan for our associates. And two, we had always had profit sharing. Actually, my great, my grandfather started profit sharing in the early 1940s, which was unheard of in our industry. I mean, it's still not, you know, every part in our industry, but he started in the 1940s. My dad converted it to an ESOP in 1979 because through an ESOP, it allowed you to have a retirement plan that could also invest back in our own company. So we would share, we'd been sharing the profits at that point for 30 plus years, but we were sharing profits and investing them in other companies like a 401k would do, right? Um, But it was company money. ESOP allows you to invest back in your own company. And there's a lot of IRS and federal guidelines around it, making sure it's done properly and for the right reasons. But that money in 1981, when my dad converted it, the cash for our associates retirement invested in the company they were working for actually is what allowed us to expand out of Petersburg, Virginia. It gave the company enough cash to be able to buy a Chevy store during a time where interest rates were in the high 20%. I mean, you know, when you've got a 28% interest rate, it's very difficult to grow and borrow money. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of it. That was why he started it. When I joined the company, we had had this ESOP for a long time, but people really didn't understand what it meant. It was just kind of like a a retirement plan that when they left, they would get some money from. And we didn't have, we didn't have a a sense of pride around it and understanding of the fact that yes, you have this retirement, but you have, you have real stock in this company. And when you work hard and perform at a high level and your fellow associates do too, the stock increases and everybody wins. Mm -hmm. And we take great care of customers. The customer is willing to pay us a profit. When they do that, our associates are making good money. When they're making good money, the company's making good money, and we put more back into the ESOP, and it's just, and then we can give more back to the community. It's truly the best example of everyone wins. Yeah. And it's one of the very few things that in in Washington, D.C., that Democrats and Republicans both agree on. Wow, I didn't know that. Both of them support ESOPs. They all support the legislation around ESOPs. It is one of the very few things they all agree on. (laughs) Wow. I think it's I just your explanation of that. I feel like every company should do that. It just makes sense. I get calls all, all the time from other car dealers who want to un- and, and even non car dealers that want to understand how to set up an ESOP. We were very fortunate that we did it back in 1979 when our company was smaller and simpler. Setting it up today would be very difficult. But the other thing you have to be willing to do to be an ESOP is you have to be willing to run your company at arm's length. So it means that an owner isn't charging their golf clubs to the parts department or having personal finances mixed in with your dealership. And you have to be willing to be fully transparent and show all of your financial statements to your associates. Because as yeah. an owner, they can get a co- they are have a right to get a copy of anything. And so I think there are a lot of dealers who love the idea of it. And then once they understand all of the details, they're like, eh, maybe I'll just do some profit sharing. Because you can do profit sharing without having to have quite all the transparency that an ESOP gives you. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so you mentioned parts, so I got to go into that topic. So you're, you know, it sounds like most of your background and was from the variable side. So um, actually not true. Not true. Oh, sorry. Okay, tell, please tell me about it. I only say that because when I was with Honda, yes, it I was in working in Honda auto sales. Okay. But when I came and ran our first store, which was a very small Volvo store, I had I think day one 14 associates and you know maybe we grew it up to like 30 but fixed stops immediately grabbed my heart I had a service manager who did not do a great job I had a parts manager who was retiring pretty quickly after we bought the store I had a fantastic group of technicians and a huge and a customer base that was super loyal in service and parts and that store was profitable because of fixed operations so I got very involved I learned how to write service, filled in, kind of took over the service manager role, got very involved in our parts department. And yes, we sold some cars, but fixed stops kind of became my passion. Mm -hmm. And it's not as normal in our industry. Most dealers and even general managers come from the front side of the business. And I've got general managers who absolutely love variable ops. So I feel like I bring more of the fixed stops focus to our company. Mm -hmm. And actually, three out of the last five general managers that we promoted and and brought up have been from the fixed operations side. Oh, Um, I love that. I lead our service manager roundtable and our parts manager roundtable every month. 
because I don't think that there's enough focus uh, from the executive level in our industry on the importance of fixed costs. Lately, yeah. I think that's adjusting and changing. It's adjusting, yes. But, but it is an area I'm that? very passionate about. I love that. And, you know, I should have known that because I do follow that you do run those those groups. And I just didn't realize that you actually worked in it. So that's, I mean, that's really. I would say if I could do any other job, like if I just needed to sell our company, get a job, I would go be a service advisor. That's my favorite position in the company. So, and you mentioned that that's where it like pulled your heart and you had that passion or you have that passion. Why at that time, what was, what about it pulled you in or what made you just light up about it? So first I love being busy and having every day different. And yeah, our service department that. at that time was much busier than our sales department. Um, and so I could go back there and I could run, run, run all day, meet 40 customers, and the day would fly by. And I felt like I was making a difference with every customer I spoke to, recommending service and helping answer questions for them on what they needed to do today versus what they could hold off on to till tomorrow. And it was just so exhilarating. And I also realized very early on running that store that the best way that I could really understand where to take the store was to, by talking to every customer after their experience. And so it was thankfully not too huge of a store, but I called every single service customer the day after they came into our service department. I personally called them, wanted to get their feedback. How could their experience be better? And it just tied me into parts and service so clearly. I just knew I had a couple people that could sell the cars fine, but I could make a bigger difference in parts and service. I love people and I could be talking to people all day long if I was back in the, in the uh, fixed ops departments. Yeah, you know, you're, you're right. You know, those days go by so fast because you're talking to so many people. And yeah, I feel like that's that's probably where I would go to if I'd work yeah. in a parts or service department. Because I do honestly, because I came from retail and in the, in the food industry and I missed that busy on my feet all day long, physically working hard. I was really hard transitioning into this environment. I think I even went back to Subway after I came over because I was like, I just miss it. Um, busy, you know, I was a lot younger then too, but you know, funny. Kaylee, one of the things I'm loving seeing is how many women we are starting to see in our fixed operations departments. Yeah. Um, almost half of our service advisors are female. We've been running between 40 to 50% the last handful of years. Our last six service managers that have been promoted or we had five promoted and one from the outside have all been women. In our stores, we have three female parts managers now, and I think we're somewhere around 8% of our technicians are female. It fluctuates, so you know, every, every day, but I think we're around 8%, which sounds so tiny, but it's four times the national average. So I'm loving seeing the growth of females and their passion for our parts and service departments. I'm loving that too. I, I really am seeing a shift being in the industry for about 10 years and just how much, how many more women and how much more focus there is around fixed operations, especially the parts, because the conversations are definitely a lot different than they were 10 years ago when I first started. Yes. It was like, just talk to my parts guy. I don't want to talk to you. Now it's like, wait, what do you do? <laughs> so it's interesting. And you, you're you starting something, and I, for, uh, forgive me if I don't know the name of it, because I remember tagging someone in the post. You're Something with women and yes. it's community. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I'm working together with Danelle Delgado. She has a training platform called Team Engage. And I've been working with her as a coach, her coaching me for about five, a little over five years. And one of my goals the last several years has been how can I make a real difference in our industry to help women invest and be developed into general managers and executive leaders? Because when you look at the data, we're still only about 22% of all dealership employees are females. We're less than 10% at the general manager level and less than 5% at the dealer and owner level. Wow. And after a couple of years of my saying this to her, she's like, Liza, when are you going to actually do something about this? Like, you've been putting it as a goal, but you haven't been taking action. You've been talking a lot about it. So I asked her to lean in with me and let use her platform, Team Engage, as the backbone for this a year of coaching, training, and community that we've created. So we have 50 women, although I think we got five more applications today. We were planning on capping it at 50. We might end up at like 53, 54, who will be working together over the next year to really in the area of personal and professional development. It is not an operational 
training program. I do think every dealer group has different ways that they want to teach someone to run a parts department or a service department or be a general manager. And so we're going to be focusing on how do we help people develop themselves around everything from communication skills to emotional intelligence to building confidence and knowing that we are capable of, of being leaders in this industry. I want women to see, hear and see stories of other women who have maybe started as a parts associate or a sales associate and are now a general manager or a dealer. So we have some really special guests that are going to be joining us. We do have men who are also going to be doing some of the speaking at our live coaching sessions because they have to have a seat at this table if we really want to make a difference with women. And then we've got a few other collaborative partners who are going to build a lot of resources on the operational side that these women will have access to. But our training will be uh, based on the Team Engage platform. So it's Engage Women in Auto Retail is the name of the group. Okay. And it'll be a weekly online training class and then a monthly live coaching call uh, with Danelle and I and then some of the special guests that we're bringing in. Okay. I have so many questions and I was like trying to write them all down, but I, I have to write words so I remember the questions to like bring <laughs> them all out. Okay. First of all, I love this concept because it's not about what you're saying, like operational training, it's personal and professional development. And I think as women, I think that's why just for me knowing, because now that I have a family, it's something that I always struggled with being that like, do I start a family? Am I going to lose my career? It might, you know, cause I, I, I didn't have my children early, but I didn't have them late. I, I had them, I don't know what you would say, but kind of in the middle, but I think that's something as women, we, we, um, it's hard. To, and then the confidence of what you mentioned too, working on all those things. And we don't take that time to work on ourselves. Right. We, we don't. And so like We're providing serving others, including yes. our children and our families. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I think having other women who have been through something like what you're talking about, yeah. just to be able to talk through and say, how do I do it all? That, that was my question to Danelle five years ago. I said, I want to be a, a mom. I still had two young kids at the time. I want to be a great wife. I want to be a great friend. I want to be involved in all the nonprofit boards that I love and passionate about. And I want to be the best CEO I can be for my company. And I always had people telling me, Liz, you, you cannot do it all. No, like, you can't. Pick the thing you want. And, and I actually said, I know I can. Yeah. I just need systems and processes and support in place so that I can do everything that I want to do and do it really well. And so that was actually my first phone call to Danelle when I didn't even know her. I'm like, I need help. And this is what I want to do. And I do feel a lot better now than I did five years ago. And I, I hope that we as women, we do have some different opportunities. And I don't even want to use the word challenges because it's not challenges. We have the opportunity to be moms. And we do. sometimes do have more responsibilities in other areas of the home life than men. Although men today also have those responsibilities. And we as CEOs need to be respectful of that. But we do, we have different things that we're dealing with. And I, I hope that we can share our stories and be mentors and coaches to other young women who are coming along and be able to give them ideas. Like, here's how I did it. Maybe ask about this. See if your company would support you in this way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and most importantly, have, like you said, having those systems and, and support and, and all in place so that you can do it all. And my whole thing that I always say is like, some days I don't do it all and that's okay. Totally. Giving yourself grace because it's just, yeah. Some you days go in seasons. You aren't going to necessarily do it all in the same day or even the same week or the same That's month. That's true. But you have seasons where you're leaning into different parts of your life. Yeah. And, and so the seasons do change. And that's do. not only acceptable, that's good. It's good that it's changing. Sometimes yeah. it's hard. You're like, oh, I thought I figured it out. And then, you're like, <laughs> and then the season changes on you. Yeah. You're like, okay, got to figure this one out again. Um, or a different season. So, um, yeah, I think that's really special. And I, I do want to go back to when you went to coaching. That's something I just recently got a coach, finally. Great. So I just want to ask, like, what at what point did you realize or did you struggle with feeling like, because I don't know if I necessarily struggled that I, if I got a coach, I didn't know anything. It was more of like, um, you know what I'm trying to say? Like getting a coach, you feel like you're getting, you're, I don't know what I'm trying to say. So I think the important thing that a coach brings has brought to me okay. is there are times where I think I had some blinders on where I was just working really hard, but staying in the path that, that I could see. 
And yeah. having a coach, and I've had I've several different coaches in different areas of my life, having a coach who asks me really good questions mm -hmm. and forces me to take time to take my blinders off and look around me. That's, a, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, so, yeah. it's so important for growth um, because we can work really hard and just charge ahead and wake up one day and be like, okay, yeah, I, I think I just had a good life. I worked really hard and I got to this particular title, but, but if we don't take time to stop and challenge our own thinking mm -hmm. and, and look around, I think we, could, we miss a lot of opportunities in life. I coaches completely... are great for that. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm discovering that because they're asking me really good questions and difficult questions. And I think it's really good for growth because for me, I hired, I want, I think I want to hire other coaches in different areas of my life. But right now I'm focusing on professional and sales. And I was hitting a point where I'm like, I don't even know what our elevator pitch is anymore because I'm, my, I'm just like so in it. And I think that things are shifting and I feel like I don't know what we do, but I do know what we do. You know, like, it's just one of those things where I'm like, I need a, I need help. <laughs> and I was struggling so bad. And, and then working with a coach, I realized, you know, I do know what I'm talking about. I do know what we do. It's okay that I can get another perspective. And I think that's kind of what you're it. saying is like the coach helps with that. Yes. Just opening your eyes. Yes. The first, the first uh, full day I spent with Danelle, she asked me for about two and a half hours. She said, tell me everything about your company. And after like two and a half hours, she looked at me and she said, Lazi, you're in the car business and you only used the word car three times in the last two and a half hours. She said, but there, there are three words I kept hearing you say, associates, customers, and community. And, as, and then she just kept asking me questions and she really helped me clarify the mission of our company, which is moving lives forward. Yeah. We move lives forward for our associates, our customers, and our community. It's perfect. <laughs> and, but I was in that same spot where I could talk for two hours about what we did and how much I loved it, but I couldn't clearly and concisely tell you, this is why we do it. This yes. is what gets me up out of bed every morning. This is the purpose of our company. And so she really helped me by asking good questions, by listening and pulling out pieces of what I was saying, helped me create. Now, I mean, we have 1,200 associates in our company that if you say, what's our mission? They're going to say, moving lives forward. That's what we do. Yeah. Period. And you look at our social media and you'll see them, you know, it's not how many cars do we sell today. It's how many lives do we move forward today? And our emails, our GMs will be like, hey, we moved 28 lives forward yesterday. And let me tell you this one story about, you know, Kaylee who came in and she bought this and that, but she's bought eight cars from us. And, you know, so it all becomes around stories and people, which is what our company is all about. I mean, you do it very well because when I think of you, I think of people and moving lives forward. And so I think you've captured what you, all the things that you were trying to say until. And it's just very authentic. It's, it's, it's so, you, yeah. can, you can hire like a marketing company to come up with what, you know, what is your company tagline? And then it's just something people say and it doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. When well, we came up with this because it came from me getting lots of questions asked, sharing lots of stories. It was so authentic that it was easy for everyone to be like, oh, yeah, that's what we do. That's yeah. what we've always been doing. We just didn't have the language for it. Mm -hmm. And then that's to get to that point, it was hiring a coach and going through those those challenging questions or not even really challenging questions, but really digging in deeper and, and really yes. dissecting. Yeah. How yeah. long did it take for you to, to finally like, oh, that's it? Was it like uh, a day? Or one day. One, one day. day. Yeah, one day. We, we were together for two days, but mm -hmm. we, we hit Moving Lives Forward like two-thirds of the way through the first day. Mm -hmm. And then we had like another day and a half to go further in the development of, of further into probably the values. After we got mission, we started diving into values. We started diving into company communications and what we wanted it to look like. So, yeah, it was a, a two-day coaching session and changed our company. Uh, just gave I us such clarity such clarity yeah that outside perspective just yeah and you had you were part of the creation of the asodu gosh it's on my shirt one of my shirts <laughs> love people love love thank love you people more than cars thank you like i know this so you were part of that too right i was it actually came out of a conversation i was having with paul daly and kyle mount before asodu i guess paul had 
had the first Asodu live stream maybe at that point. Okay. Um, but Kyle was not a part of Asodu yet, or he was just joining. And we were having a conversation, and they, they were, like, interviewing me or chatting with me or trying to learn a little bit about me. And I was like, I'm not a car person. And I said, you know, we, we, we love cars, but we love people more. And then as we kept talking, I was like, it's simple. Love people more than cars. You know, that's, that's where our industry needs to go. And so then they kind of adopted it. And um, actually, I've got it right here uh, on my next to me on this little card that I send out to our team. And I can't tell you how proud I am of what the SODU has built and, and how Paul and Kyle have really taken that sentiment and, and created a web of people all across this country in our industry who are like-hearted. And I should say, I would say like-minded, but I think we actually all have, we're not all like-minded. I think we have different opinions and experiences, but we're all like-hearted. And it has absolutely created a new energy in our industry that we needed and that we deserve. And I have met so many wonderful people through a SODU. It's been life-changing, I think, for a lot of a lot of people in our industry that were looking for that heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah, it's been wonderful. There was something good about COVID, even if we, you know, don't like to admit it. hundred years is a long time. I look back on where we were a hundred years ago and it was a time where electric vehicles were actually first introduced and we were at a crossroads back in 1924. We had electric vehicles and gasoline powered vehicles um, on our showroom floor. And at that point, the industry went gas, you know, for a lot of different reasons. And I, when I look forward a hundred years and try to even envision what that will look like, you know, I think there will be technologies out there that we, we just can't even envision right now. But what excites me and what I love about our industry and what I'm trying to drive home with our team is that if we continue to focus on attracting, retaining, and developing great associates in our company who then are creating great relationships that are based on trust with our customers, we want to be the trusted advisors for our customers as they're going to navigate, I believe, some of the harder questions around transportation, things they've never been um, having to thought, think about before over the next 100 years. So who knows, maybe it's in 30 years or 20 years, they might have to make a decision whether riding in a car is something they're comfortable with versus driving a car. Like if autonomous vehicles actually becomes a thing, there's some decisions that consumers are going to have to make. Whether electric vehicles are our future or whether there are other alternative fuel options, we want to be the trusted advisor that they come to to say, help me, help me down this journey. Help me make a decision whether moving to an EV is the right thing for me or, or down the road autonomous. Or I don't know if, you know, for a while subscriptions were a big thing. There might oh. be some alternative way of owning a car. I don't think subscriptions are necessarily it, but there might be a different alternative to how you buy and own a car in the future. And sure. if we can keep great people in our industry, building relationships with customers, using technology to wrap the relationship. The technology can't be the relationship. The people are the relationship. We're going to be here over the next hundred years to help our consumers and our communities navigate through what transportation is going to look like a hundred years from now. It'll look really different. It will. If we're the trusted advisor, we will still be here in the right way. Absolutely. I love how you wrap that up because I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, being that trusted advisor on ma just making those decisions because transportation is going to change the way that in a hundred, definitely in a hundred years. No question. <laughs> no Probably question. in 20, but 
<laughs> yeah, probably in 20 and we'll still be around to see it. And it, it, it's going to be really fun. And it's, you know, our, our industry is resilient and it's never going to go away. It's that's what I think I love. People most. are always going to need transportation to get where they want to go in life. Now, whether Absolutely. it's a flying vehicle or a scooter, I don't know, but they're still going to need something that gets them there. And that's our, that's our space. That's absolutely our space. So thank you so much, Liza, for coming on. I really enjoyed our conversation. And um, if anyone wants to reach out to you, I'm sure they can find you on LinkedIn and we'll provide all the links below. Yeah. LinkedIn, so. Facebook, Instagram. I'm pretty easy to find. I would love to connect with any like-hearted automotive associates and people in our industry. Thank you. I love how you say that, like-hearted, because, you know, it's okay that we don't see the same thing. The like-heartedness is the the good part. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, Liza. Thanks, Bailey. Thanks so much for joining me on the Trailblaze Your Path podcast. I hope you're leaving us inspired. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It really helps. Follow me on social media, check out our YouTube channel for more content, and remember, new episodes drop every other Friday. Keep blazing your own trail, and I'll catch up with you next time.